So in this verse, Arjuna speaks of how perfect persons glorify Krishna. That's the natural for every purified person to glorify Krishna. If we find someone who's very great, the natural tendency is to glorify him. And Krishna is the greatest of the great. For some people are great, but not in a very nice way. They are very powerful, and if you don't glorify them, they uh, punish you. And sometimes people glorify others because they want to get some benefit from them. But Arjuna is praising Krishna out of his pure heart, Arjuna's pure heart. And he also mentions that people who are not of pure heart, they don't like to glorify Krishna. <coughs> Yesterday and this morning we were in Tiruvannamalai. So, the, of course, that's famous for the very large Shiva temple there. So, traditionally in Tamil Nadu, there's been rivalries between worshippers of Shiva and worshippers of Vishnu. <coughs> and they were actually very inimical towards each other at one point in time. But the tendency to... Uh, the, 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 the Vaishnavas would say bad things about Shiva and the Shaivites would say bad things about Vishnu. But our perspective is that uh, they should both be glorified. Shiva is also... We are Vaishnavas, worshippers of Vishnu, but we recognize that Shiva is a very great person. But it's also good to understand how he is great and why he is great. It's stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Vaishnavanang yata... Next word, Sambhu. next word. Shambhu. Lord Shiva is always glorifying Krishna. Therefore, he is great. So Krishna should be glorified. How should he be glorified? How much can we glorify him? We hear of Ananta Shish. He has 1,000 mouths and since time immemorial he's been glorifying Krishna. He never says the same thing twice and he didn't come to an end and never will. Krishna's qualities... <coughs> should be glorified. His beautiful form should be glorified. His devotees should be glorified. This is called bhakti or devotion. So how shall we glorify Krishna? It's difficult to think where to begin. But our Vaishnava gurus, they've written thousands and thousands of songs and prayers in glorification of Krishna. And how, can we, how many can we remember? So there's one very simple process in which all the glorification is brought together. What is that? Chanting the names of Krishna. Especially the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. If we think how we can glorify <laughs> Krishna properly, it becomes a very difficult task. Because Krishna is very great and we're very small. It's very difficult for us to even imagine how great Krishna is. And our intelligence is very limited. So how, how much can we understand about the greatness of Krishna? But we know that Krishna is pleased when we chant his names. And we also become pleased. Is it? Yes. You're feeling happy by chanting Hare Krishna. Why should we be happy by <laughs> chanting Hare Krishna? There's so many other things you can chant. What's the... Uh, what's the present popular Tamil <laughs> film song? That's also names of the... Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Krishna's name. Is it? Yeah. That's very good. Mukunda. <laughs> 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 It's nice. It's coming back in fashion. <laughs> anyway, there are so many things we can chant. Prabhupada, I think it's Prabhupada, gave the example that you can chant Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, but, <laughs> but no one becomes happy by chanting Coca-Cola. And we become bored very quickly after about 20 seconds by chanting Coca-Cola. <laughs> But we see that devotees go on chanting Hare Krishna all their lives. Rupa Goswami was lamenting that he only had one tongue and only one pair of ears. <laughs> because he's finding that this chanting is so nice. 
wants to chant more and more and hear more and more the sound of Krishna's name. And it's a very simple process. Rupa Goswami, who's heard of Rupa Goswami? Please raise your hand. Those who are reading the books, they have heard of Rupa Goswami. So he was a very great scholar, Sanskrit scholar. What's the name of, who can tell the name of any book that he wrote? Upadesh Amrita. And the other one? Bhakti Anyone know any others? He wrote many more, but these, these two are very famous. Lagu Bhagavatamrita, Hamza Dutta, Vidakta Madhva, Lalita Madhva. So many books. So, uh, it's very difficult for us to even understand the books, let alone even think of writing such books. Because after all, uh, Krishna, he is everything and he has all qualities. So, to explain that fully or to attempt to explain that fully, that requires a very high level of scholarship. <clears throat> but the essence of all that glorification is chanting the names of Krishna. So we can't expect that we'll all be very great scholars. And even the greatest scholar, how much can we understand about Krishna? But we can all chant Hare Krishna. It's very easy. As Rupa Goswami said in one of his prayers, glorifying the name of Krishna, that everyone who has a tongue and two lips can chant Hare Krishna. Only those who are deaf, they can't hear the holy name. But actually there are many devotees of Krishna throughout the world now who uh, they chant Hare Krishna by sign language. I don't know how exactly it works, but I've seen some of these devotees and they look very blissful. So everyone can take part in this immediately. Even without understanding the deep philosophy that is uh, part of Krishna consciousness. But without undergoing any prior purification, everyone can take part in this. Until recently in India, only certain people were allowed in the temples. And they uh, only people of certain castes were allowed in the temple. Other people were considered too impure. And then to go in the <coughs> temple, one has to uh, bathe first and be pure. And to actually offer worship in the temple, one has to go through so many procedures. But for chanting the holy names, there's no prior purification required. Of course, it's good if one can be bathed and pure and clean. But in any condition, one can chant the holy names of Krishna. And in fact, we are enjoined to chant the holy names of Krishna in all circumstances. It's not that you have to bathe in the morning and then chant Hare Krishna. As soon as we wake up, chant Hare Krishna. And last thing at night, chant Hare Krishna. And then during the intervening time, we can also chant Hare Krishna. And then what will you dream of at night? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Did anyone have that experience? You do the same thing all day and at night in your dream you do the same thing. So if we go on chanting Hare Krishna, we'll be chanting Hare Krishna in our dream also. One story I heard, the, uh, this is long back, 1930s something like that. In one of the Goryamad temples, the, uh, some people came and they, they gave some water or some drink or, and they, they gave it to the people there and it was actually drugged because they wanted them to, uh, they wanted to steal everything. So they drugged them and then whatever they did, I don't know. Sometimes there'd only be two people in the mat and then they'd, they'd say, we brought some sweet or something like this. So that archaka, that priest, was taken to the hospital. And every day at the even the evening, he would be ringing the bell and going like this. So in his unconscious condition, he was going like this. Maybe uh, that kind of worship is even more pleasing to Krishna. Just like we read in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, we were just talking about the book of the Brahmana who performed worship within his mind. So if you do the worship in your mind, you can. there's no limit to how opulent you can make it. So he was, every day he would go into deep meditation and be completely absorbed in how he was serving the Lord with great opulence. And then one day he cooked some liquid payasam, this uh, sweet rice. 
But he, in his, he was thinking it's too, all in his meditation, he was thinking maybe it's too hot to offer. So in his meditation, he put his finger to test it. <laughs> too hot. And he came out of his, he was, he was feeling it as so real that he came out of his meditation and saw his finger is burned. Krishna was accepting his offering. So that is the essence of glorification of Krishna, the, the feeling that I want to serve Krishna and glorify him. In the chanting there is singing and playing musical instruments. So what's the most important part? Madanga. It's the singing, yeah. Singing is the most important part. Right? What's the most important part in the singing? Hare Krishna, someone says. Someone says he's pointing at the throat. Any other suggestions? The tongue. The tongue. Can't do anything unless there's the palate and the lips and the teeth. <laughs> Any other suggestion? Bhakti. Bhakti. Devotion, yeah, that's right. What's the most important part? The tongue? Or the lips, or the palate, or the throat. Number heart. Heart. That's right. <laughs> Kirtan comes from here. Srila <coughs> Prabhupada said that the uh, chanting is like the calling of a child for his mother. How does a child call for the mother? The child. <laughs> 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 no, he doesn't say Amma, he says Amma! <laughs> the child, there's no, the child doesn't think, should I call for my mother or should I not call for my mother? Doesn't think, is it my duty to call for my mother? He just has complete faith that the mother is the well wisher without any intellectual process, has complete faith that my mother fully cares for me in all respects. Of course, the mother sometimes punishes the child also when they get a little bit older. Sometimes a lot. Srila Prabhupada told one example from his, uh, one anecdote from his personal experience that in his, uh, when he was living with his family in Calcutta, that... Uh, he heard some s screaming from next door and then the, the woman is shouting. So they had an underground intelligence system. And if there's no word for underground right yeah. there, <laughs> literally, they send a rat or something. It's a like spy system. No. What's the word for spy? <laughs> spy. No. There is a word. Is no. like there is a word. Gupta Dutam or something. No. No. What's the word? What transfer? I don't know. I have to look that one up. Then uh, they'd send their servant, and then the servant would ask the servant in the next house, and then they'd get the news. So what had happened, the mother was beating her son, who was screaming, because the older brother had typhoid. And in typhoid, solid food is forbidden. Heavy food is forbidden. Ghanamana food is... <laughs> Huh? It was very dangerous. So, but the uh, elder brother had typhoid. He smelled that there were paratas being cooked. Parota, yes, parota, parota, parata. It's like a fried bread. It's very tasty. <laughs> so this boy was feeling I'm starving. And then my mother's starving me. I'm hardly eating. He, he told his younger brother. Smuggle me some parata. <laughs> <laughs> so Tambi was in a difficult situation. <laughs> that uh, if he did, he, he faced punishment from his mother. And if he didn't, when his older brother got healthy, he'd get punished by him. So anyway, he, the younger brother smuggled his elder brother some parata. Uh, and his mother found out. Hence the screaming and shouting. Now, why did the mother do that? She was very cruel. Why should she beat her own son? That was uh, out of affection. She didn't want the uh, older son to die. So out of affection, the uh, there may be punishment also. 
But there's a very nice saying collected by Rupa Goswami also in his Padavali, one, one uh, observation, that even if the child is punished by the mother, the child has no place to go for shelter other than the mother. So even if we're trying to glorify Krishna and so many things go wrong and we feel we're being punished by Krishna, but still we have no shelter than Krishna. So here Arjuna says to Krishna, Rishikesh, the world becomes joyful upon hearing your name. Seems in the modern world especially there's a, a lot more joy is needed. People are living joyless lives. They have TVs and all kinds of things for entertainment, but there's no joy. As we were coming from Tiruvannamalai this morning, we stopped in Arani. So there was a Kirtan group there. It's uh, Sri it means Tamil Vaishnavas. So they were all uh, older men and obviously uh, they were not very rich, but they were rich with bhakti. They took, they were chanting the holy names of Krishna with obvious pleasure and devotion. So uh, it's quite obvious that it's a lot better to, even if you don't have a lot of money, to have uh, joy and devotion to Krishna than to have Lots and lots of money and no joy. One of our devotees in New Zealand, he just uh, did a PhD in accounting. I never heard of PhDs in accounting, but now I heard of it. <laughs> there's no word for PhD in Tamil. It's not, it's not a traditional Tamil thing, that's for sure. <laughs> so he was suggesting a new, uh, apart from just Exact what they call there is what's called the bottom line yes. in accounts. The bottom line is that the uh, money balance. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, you know, Payment. trial balance. Payment. Is it? All right. You know, you're a businessman. You have balance business sheet. people here. Yeah. You know, you know all about it. Balance sheet. How's your balance sheet? No, I don't see that. You don't see it. All right. You must see it. Someone should. I hope you see it. <laughs> you might be losing money. At this <laughs> so anyway, the bottom line, when you look through all the different lines, look at the bottom line. Is it plus or minus? minus. So this devotee was suggesting that we need to completely revise our whole system of accounting. That the uh, profit and loss, monetary profit and loss is only one factor. But we also have to see how people are healthy and happy. What are their qualities? Are they developing qualities? And uh, interestingly, the per you have to defend a PhD thesis. That means some professor comes and attacks and tries to pull it down and you have to defend your... So this devotee, he was presenting all this absolutely in... The, in giving all quotes from Bhagavad Gita as it is. And the professor who was uh, attacking him was an Indian Mayavadi. And you have, you have to do it in a public, with all the, not exactly public, with all big scholars there. So he defended it successfully. In other words, he uh, established his thesis on the basis of Bhagavad Gita as it is. And then he sold a copy of Bhagavad Gita as it is to each of his professors. So, you are all devotees and you can appreciate that we should glorify Krishna. Unfortunately, most people don't. And they're really missing the actual purpose of this rare human form of life. So, apart from uh, ourselves being happy and Krishna conscious, we have to try to convince others on the philosophical basis of Bhagavad Gita as it is, why they should also join the chanting. And... Uh, Despite India's uh, enthusiastic embrace, apart from uh, ourselves being happy and Krishna conscious, we have to try to convince others on the philosophical basis of Bhagavad Gita as it is, why they should also join the chanting. And uh, despite India's uh, enthusiastic embracing of... <coughs> 
uh, materialistic culture, still many, many people can appreciate that this bhakti is the actual life that makes us alive. Especially in Tamil Nadu, there's been so much atheistic propaganda. But still, despite that, more and more people are going to the temple. They probably don't even understand why. But that natural feeling is there that we have to go and glorify. So if we give them this knowledge, and they can understand why they're doing it. They become very happy, actually. What do you think, Jai Panduranga? traveled throughout much of Tamil Nadu in his old age, giving out these books. It's a very good work, retired life. Instead of... He has been to Prasad. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Instead of sitting at home and watching TV and becoming a <laughs> human vegetable, couch potato, you can go out and give this knowledge to others. I think that was a cue to bring these certificates, was it? Because it's not certificate, it's pronoun. Oh, it's an Okay. All right, because it's, it's just recently you're all at Tiruvannamalai for the for distributing books. <coughs> so please go on, that's all I can say. And of course we should read and understand the philosophy in these books as far as possible. It's not possible to understand everything about Krishna. But this, uh, at least this knowledge in Bhagavad Gita, we should try and absorb it. As Srila Prabhupada often used to say, it's not enough to say that God is great, but we should try to understand how He is great. Hare Krishna. I'll finish that. Is there any question? He said the prayer should be in the mood of uh, a child crying for mother. Uh, but at the same time, Arjuna was not in that mood towards Krishna. Yes, say in Tamil, so everyone can hear it also. That's a very interesting question. Because we find that uh, Arjuna, he, he was Krishna's friend. So that's a very advanced position. And when he saw, this chapter is the famous chapter of the universal form, the Vishwarupa. And I saw quite a few people were... Well, not some were chanting the verse from memory because often if people memorize any chapter, they memorize this one or chapter 12, which is... So, uh, a friend, they, they deal, friends deal with each other very intimately. They slap each other on the back and maybe jokingly call each other some bad names. If you're a very intimate friend, you can do it. But then after seeing this... Uh, form of the universe of Krishna Arjuna became afraid and he started praying to Krishna now a friend doesn't pray to another friend so Prabhupada comments in the purport that actually Arjuna came down a step because the mood of being an intimate friend of Krishna is uh, that's it's more intimate and therefore uh, more advanced than one who uh, appreciates the greatness in this verse which we read today, uh, Arjuna is talking about the siddhas, or the perfect devotees. So Arjuna himself is a perfect devotee. Most of us aren't. We have to, st we have to progress toward that stage. So the first stage is to appreciate the greatness of Krishna and develop our feelings for him and, and trust in him like a child for the mother. So that is the basic stage of devotion. And uh, as one becomes very advanced, there may be even more intimate feelings. The child calling for the mother is a very, uh, it's a very intimate relationship. But there's a better, a better relationship than the child calling for the mother is the mother looking after the child. The mother actually cares for the child more than the child cares for the mother. That's why the position of being Krishna's mother and father is more glorious than that of being his servant in the Vaikuntha or Golok Lila. So this is rasa vichar or consideration of uh, feelings on the platform of love. It's a very high topic. But uh, we have to begin somewhere. So uh, we begin trying to develop love for Krishna appropriate to our present situation. First we understand that Krishna is great, that we are fully dependent on Him, and that He is our real well-wisher. With that trust we call out to Him, 
But then just like when the child grows up more, then instead of just demanding things from the parents, if they can think how to serve the parents, that's a good child. So this is a very big discussion. I won't get into it more. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. I think many of you might like to sit and discuss about Krishna all night. <coughs> Some of you may also want to take prasad, and then you, <laughs> the parents have to go home and get their children ready tomorrow morning also. Anything else?